Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass PNC, and I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? Cover the advertisement I accidentally just did for a certain donut <laughs> company. But other than that, I'm fine. It's early morning here, and I am drinking some coffee. Today, we're talking about something that happened, I want to say, God, now, a week and a half, two weeks ago, something like that. We're, we're going to be talking about a couple well-known media personalities is what I will call them. I don't know. I guess Kara Swisher is a journalist. Scott Galloway is a professor at, um, I believe, NYU. Um, and we're going to talk about them and a bit of a weird, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I'm not sure how to describe what that was. And, and yeah, maybe you can kind of explain to our audience what happened. On a recent episode of their podcast, they did an ad read, and the ad read they did was for a service that enables people to invest their retirement savings, their tax advantage retirement savings, in a variety of cryptocurrencies, some more legitimate, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, and some much less legitimate, like Axie Infinity, the notorious play-to-earn game. And this was a very controversial ad read because, uh, like we talked about when John Reed Stark was on, the U.S. Department of Labor like issued a very specific warning about investing retirement funds in Bitcoin due to its volatility and the risks. And so on the heels of that, this came across to many as Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway endorsing putting your retirement savings into cryptocurrency. The initial retort from Kara Swisher was something along the lines of cryptocurrency is here to stay. If you don't like it, good for you. I don't really care. I'm going to keep doing these advertisements. We're going to keep doing these ad reads. If that means we lost you as a listener, oh, well, I don't really give a damn, which, you know, look, I, I want to say that I, I previously, when we started our podcast, I definitely came out swinging at some some people who were like, well, I think it's a little bit too quiet or I would like to see you guys do this or maybe you could try to I, I would come out swinging and try to like defend our choices. I've I've softened up a bit on that and I think it's great and it's actually helped us immensely to listen to our to listen to our listeners and let their criticisms but also what they like about our show, listen to that to help us grow and build our show to be better, right? And I think seeing that response from her was really like, I, I found it hard to believe. Like, I was like, wow, not only do you clearly not care about your listeners and their opinions, but it, it felt so obviously like money over um, money over people, I guess. Podcasts are in a really weird place in the market, right? The primary avenue available for people to easily monetize their podcast is to do these ad reads. The fundamental issue with doing any of these ad reads is your audience hears you say these words and they hear you saying them. Like, there's no real separation between you as the podcaster, you as the journalist, and the material you're promoting. It's like fundamentally the same problem as like local news station running their bullshit sponsored content, right? Or for that matter, the New York Times running its bullshit sponsored content, right, is that when you take these things and you make them kind of look like news and you integrate them into the news, you're taking advantage of the fact that a meaningful portion of your audience is going to take that as an endorsement, is going to treat it as like part of the rest of the material. And so you get into this really challenging ethical area here where like, the things you endorse and the things that you advertise end up associated with you. And I think that there's a lot of people like Kara who don't think that's fair. They imagine an age of journalism back like in the old days when like Time Inc. still had a firewall between editorial and the business side, right? Where the journalists could follow a story, there'd be ads run near the story, but they're distant enough from the process those ads are coming from that they can just do the thing and pretend that they have no knowledge of what the ads are, right? But that is like really no longer possible with the way these companies and stuff work, which is put a lot of people in some really uncomfortable situations. Well, and it's worth 
at this point discussing our own situation, which is we have been doing this podcast for over a year now and there are no ads. There's no sponsorship. There's none of this stuff. And I would say that that's because we care so much and it's because we're so great. The reality is that we we fear the idea that we're going to get advertisements and sponsorships from companies that we don't like, that we don't trust, and that we don't want to do that. We don't want to present ourselves as endorsing these companies to to the people who listen to our show and expect us as skeptics, as cynics, as critics to not just jump into anything and be like, yeah, we're going to suggest you buy this thing, or maybe you put your retirement into this thing, or we love uh, gold or what, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. We're trying to avoid that as much as we can. And it's really hard. I don't, I don't, I, I want to make it clear to everybody that, that of course we would like to be making money. I, of course, I, we've seen uh, little cheat sheets of um, what some other podcasts are able to make by per quarter um, based on the ads that they they sell. Um, and this is from a few years ago. So maybe the prices have gone down. Maybe they've gone up. Who knows? Who knows what the reality on the ground is these days? But all I can say is that, like, if those numbers are accurate, we could be making significantly more if we just didn't give a damn about that stuff. And and so this was a an eye opening moment for me, I guess, uh, seeing Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway, who are two of the biggest names in tech, kind of just blowing this off as like, who, who gives a shit, dude? This is what we do. And and I, I yeah, I found it surprising. I didn't because they're right. Who gives a shit? This is what they do. Right. Like and we're we're in a very privileged position. Like we both are able to afford to do this for free because we've got money coming in from other places. We don't depend on Crypto Critics Corner in order to survive. Do you think that Kara Swisher and Scott continue? Galloway don't have jobs that are able to give them the money and compensation required to be able to do their podcast for free? That's extra money on top. I think let's be real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I imagine because this podcast is being produced under the New York Times brand right now, I think, their podcast. And so I'm sure they've got certain contractual commitments they've agreed to, right? And like in the broad scope of things, no one really does care, right? Like a few online weirdos on Twitter care, but that's not a good judge of how the world views an issue. If you if you base your opinion on how the world views an issue and how weirdos on Twitter react, you're going to have a very skewed perception, right? Every podcast does this. And like I mentioned before, Time Inc. tore down their firewall. New York Times does sponsored content. Every news station is doing integrated sponsored content. Like the Forbes has totally cashed in on their brand using their contributor program. Like every single one of these things is compromised. Just because other brands are losing their reputations. I don't know what to say about this stuff. It's very weird to me that um, a lot of outlets, media personalities... Uh, kind of just these these corporations are operating in such a way that they're entirely putting reputation aside. Reputation does not matter. The number one goal is money. And it's like an illness in our society. I feel like it's it's like it's uh, it's just a sign of the times like nobody the, it's it's short term thinking over long term thinking. I, and And that's what you and I have been consistently reminding ourselves of like, well, if we want to do this show in five years or 10 years, if we want to still exist, who knows, maybe we don't. But if we do, we we can't tarnish our reputation by taking on any advertiser. Yeah, I think you're kind of getting at what's the core issue here, right? Is that broadly across society, our remaining institutions are very rarely engaged in like the work necessary to build and maintain trust, reputation, and integrity, and much more often are creating products that implicitly or explicitly cash in on the historic reputation, right? That's foundationally why Forbes launched their contributor program. It was a way for them to basically sell their reputation to the highest bidder. Other ones have kept some 
greater degree of separation and some higher degree of plausible deniability. The, the New York Times likes to really flirt with the lines here, right? Like, even when they did their sponsored content integration for, like, the second season of Orange is the New Black, the reporting it was based around was, like, legitimate high-quality reporting. But at the end of the day, it was still, like, sponsored content for Netflix you're integrating into your newspaper, right? And I think this is also kind of the challenge you see with any new media brand that launches. And we talked about this a little bit way back in episode eight when we were talking about Coinbase Media, right? Is it's really hard to monetize journalism. It's really hard to want to make people read like thoughtful and nuanced takes on issues, right? And this becomes especially true when you've taken like investor VC money and there's this pressure to try to get to a point where there is profits and money more quickly because what you're talking about is true. Building up that trust and maintaining that reputation takes such a long time. It is seen as a bad investment by many of the people who matter in the industry. I think a lot of what it comes down to is that a lot of people who start covering crypto implicitly or explicitly accept certain assumptions from the cryptocurrency industry. Like, uh, remember when Roos was basically trying to say, like, journalists need to be allowed to own crypto and benefit from the increase in value in crypto, because otherwise, how are they supposed to cover crypto? Or um, Larry Cermak, who runs research at The Block, was basically saying that it's not possible for them to recruit talented journalists who understand the industry if they were to have prohibitions against like owning cryptocurrency and doing that kind of thing. Or like Coindesk was working on a way to start giving equity grants from DCG to some of like their uh, editors and executives and stuff like that. And so across all of those, you see examples of how once people start covering cryptocurrency and seeing these people make all this money from cryptocurrency, they become increasingly convinced that they should be allowed to participate in that. Okay, so this you brought up another interesting um, moment, which I think is worth bringing up since we're talking about Kara Swisher and, and Scott Galloway here, which is, oh man, I, I'm going to try not to get a little... Um, flustered thinking about this because it actually bothers me the way that he um, spoke to Molly White, a guest of the show and friend of the show, a good friend of the show. He went on Scott Galloway's podcast and he compared, he did this thing called the Latecomer's Guide to Crypto for the New York Times. Skeptics and critics basically said, yo man, this is a how to buy cryptocurrency. It, this is, it's a shill. What you're doing here is pretty much a shill. It is not a, it is not like an objective, fair look at the cryptocurrency industry and ecosystem. He didn't like that. He didn't like that that was the response and that um, Molly, I think uh, it was Molly who got a bunch of critics and skeptics to write like, wrote the reality of the situation next to all the shilling that Kevin Reese was doing. Which, full disclosure, I did contribute to. Fair enough. I can understand why an author might not appreciate that. But uh, he then went on the Scott Galloway podcast and expressed that he thought his um, cryptocurrency kind of shilling article uh, was essentially the Wikipedia entry for cryptocurrency. And uh, Molly, Molly White like does work she volunteers for wikipedia and she was like uh no this is nothing like the wikipedia entry for cryptocurrency and he got offended by that kevin roos who's on paternal paternal leave came back to argue with molly white about the efficacy of his of his article and to suggest that there's something else going on Whatever that means, I don't know what he meant by that. My intuition is that Kevin didn't particularly mean much and was just lashing out because his ego was wounded because like 20 people came in and did a line by line <laughs> response to his article, which as a writer, can't <laughs> feel good to just have people going, no, this is wrong. No, this is wrong. No, this is wrong. This is deceitful. This is unclear. This is wrong. That that can't feel good, right? Um <laughs> And and so I, I don't think he actually believes there's some, like, big FUD paying off Molly. He's just mad and lashing out on Twitter. Um, but, yeah, you're right. There is – it is hard to cover cryptocurrency well, and a lot of people do it really poorly. I think I'm not even trying to suggest – look, if – 
if Kara and Scott Galloway, if Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway want to endorse cryptocurrencies and they love cryptocurrencies, I don't I don't take issue with that. And I don't and if if Kevin Roos wants to tell everyone that NFTs and cryptocurrencies are the greatest thing in, in the world, that's fine. I, again, I do not take issue with that. If that is going to be your role, you, you're expressing bias in such a way that it makes it hard to pretend like what you're doing is news anymore. I don't find the latecomer's guide to cryptocurrency to be news. I don't think it's it's anywhere near news. And when I try to think of what is news in cryptocurrency and digital assets and tech, uh, maybe people hate to hear this, but the news is usually not the greatest stuff in the world. That's why it's news. It's, it's news because something surprising and usually not great happens. So if all you're going to report on is kind of people getting rich and all of the good shit that's happening in a new and upcoming industry, while I can appreciate that, that there's room for that, if you're not reporting any of the bad stuff simultaneously and you're not like – you're not trying to break stories about some of the cra- – there's so many stories. Let's be real. There's so many stories in this industry to break. Uh, thank God for Zach, XBT, uh, on Twitter because, because nobody else is doing the work. These are the people who should be doing the work. You're, you're a journalist at the New York Times. Why aren't you doing what Zach XBT does? That's, that's your job. Yes. It, it certainly should be. <laughs> um, we got kind of close to this in episode eight, but I felt like I didn't really have the words for it now. I really worry about more and more of like things that look to me like journalism or look like they should be journalism, like people honestly pursuing the truth and trying to cover these important things get more and more co-opted and pushed into kind of like this broader media umbrella and for like these more like broadly media companies rather than news or journalism companies, right? And when this happens, you just end up with this expectation of creating, God, I hate the word, content, which can be monetized, sold, advertised on, which is kind of antithetical to news. And like when your goal is to create things that make money, conflicts of interest no longer seem like such a big deal. Loops us back to Kara Swisher, <laughs> unfortunately, because during this whole thing people pointed out that on a podcast a while ago she had mentioned that she had 10 bitcoin at this, one point this kills me and she isn't this kills me by the way because because the entire argument is so typical for what we see in cryptocurrency and we've seen it from a lot of journalists we've seen it from a lot of old school ogs who've been around since 2013 or whatever like it happens all the time but please sorry go on yeah, so she mentioned on this podcast, um, I don't remember which podcast it was, it was one of the Vox Media ones, I think, that she owned 10 She's Bitcoin. She's also tweeted about it, by and, the way. Yes, and the host asked her if this was an ethics issue with the kind of Casey stuff she Newton, covered. Casey Newton, I believe, her response, uh, was her co-host on that Vox or whatever um, podcast, and he, he didn't ask her, he told her specifically that owning Bitcoin was breaching the ethics uh, terms for Vox. He he told her straight up. At at which point she decided to explain that she wasn't actually sure where the Bitcoin were. Maybe they're in a storage unit. She's not 100% sure. She bought them when they were super cheap and now they're just somewhere, probably maybe. And that was a really unsatisfying answer from a journalist. It's, it's a really satisfying answer from anyone. And, and I'll tell you... For a couple reasons why. One, if indeed uh, she has that ten, those 10 Bitcoin, I don't know, unless you have $100 million, like, that's a lot of money. I can't imagine you're just like, meh, I don't need it. Who cares? No one thinks that way. No one. So I don't buy that for that reason. Um, I also don't buy it because she she tries to claim like, oh, yeah, I've had 10 Bitcoin uh, they're, they're probably on a hard drive. Uh, actually they're probably lost. Uh, and, and so what I think that does, what that allows her to give herself is like, I've been involved with Bitcoin forever. 
Like I know all about Bitcoin. I, I totally get it. I've owned it for a long time. I'm an OG. She, she can make those claims now without providing any fucking proof at all. So it gives you it gives you the ability to be to like make the claim that you've been involved in Bitcoin in terms of ownership for a very long time. And it makes it sound like you held it and you have all this cash still because you cho- because you made the decision to just I'm just going to throw that hard drive to the side and, you know, I'll get back to that wallet when I need it. Like, come on, man. It's it's not true. There's there's no reality to it. If you have it, you should you should definitely it's like like uh, Casey Newton was saying, there's ethics reasons. You have to disclose that then if you do own it, you have to disclose it. And if it's lost then you should stop saying that you have 10 Bitcoin. Yeah, and you should talk about what you learned about how hard it is to keep a stock of 10 Bitcoin and the risks that can come up and how you can end up losing it. Because otherwise you sound kind of like the guy who got his tax bill and said, oh no, I had a boating accident this weekend. (laughs) I know it probably just, it feels like we're like personally attacking journalists here, but that really is not what we're trying to do. I I think both of us were pretty frustrated from these threads that we've been seeing. We're pretty frustrated from the way people have been kind of discussing ethics, morals, um, objectivity. Um, I want to be clear. I I think my views have softened a bit in terms of, honestly, I think the best in, in the cryptocurrency industry, the best possible newsroom you could have would be a newsroom that would be like 50, 50 divided coiners and no coiners. I think what no coiners are, much better at than coiners is archiving and logging this history and making sure everybody understands the history and why the history is important. While coiners love to move on really, really fast to the next project, but they often understand the intricacies and complexities better than a no coiner might, right? Because they're, they are interacting with the platforms and stuff. So, so I understand the need um, for some journalists and some media uh, personalities to either interact with or use this stuff. I also think if you want to f- speculate and gamble, that's fine too. I'm not upset about that either. I just think there's biases. There, there is. I think you and I do a good job of expressing our biases. Uh, our biases, like we, you and I, talk about talk about being <laughs> no coiners. Talk about being critics. Talk about being skeptics. It's it's the it's these. It's right there exactly. in the title. It's the, it's, and, and we make that clear. I think that's I, – the, I was trying to think about it yesterday, and, uh, and Hunter S. Thompson came to my mind because what he did was he embraced all of his confusing biases, right? Like he was on drugs. He was totally insane, and he would, he would tell you, like, I'm seeing a hallucination or whatever. But you trusted him because of that. That's why you trust Hunter S. Thompson when he's telling you these stories, because he's already out the gate telling you, like, I'm fucked up. I don't know what's going on. And uh, here's what I'm seeing. And then you're like, well, at least he's honest. At least he's honest and he's sharing that with me. I feel like a lot of this stuff comes off as not just dishonest, but um, like diplomatic, you know, like walking that line of like, "Eh." I don't really need to tell you the truth because the truth is relative, right? And you're like, mm, no, your job is to make sure the truth isn't relative. Yeah, that, that's actually a pretty big softening of your stance over the last several years because you used to be For more sure. pretty strongly that journalists covering crypto shouldn't own crypto. I certainly agree with you that journalists covering crypto should be able to use cryptocurrency. And so if that means they need to own enough that they can do interactions, interact with these contracts, try different things, I am not opposed to that. I do still get worried about people who are invested in crypto and covering crypto for the same reason I get worried about people who are invested in specific stocks and covering those stocks, is that once you add in that financial incentive, things get messy. It's much harder to maintain the orientation towards truth. I think that mostly covers it. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add. Yeah. I, I mean, I think what I want to add to close this out is that the individuals we're discussing, we're really not trying to come at them specifically. All the people we're discussing have done good and valuable work. Kevin, Kara, Scott, all of them have contributed in valuable ways to like 
important things. It's just that these incentives get really perverse and that when you're in this position of trust, using that position of trust to endorse things like this gets really messy and can put your audience, your listeners, and the people who trust you to try to find the truth in a really unfortunate position. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that when you read ad, when you read copy for a platform that might be doing some weird, shady, not appropriate shit, you should take that your time, pause, reflect and realize that when your voice is the one that's saying that copy, people think it's you endorsing it. So while I saw that Kara, and it was largely just Kara, didn't give a damn what people were saying about this this copy read and, and uh, how grossed out they were by it, I think it's worth reflecting on and that she didn't take that time and hopefully she is now. Hopefully she's taken that time now and has thought about this a little bit more. She should probably also check that storage unit. <laughs> Just, you know, find out if there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of Bitcoin, you know, hanging out in your storage unit. That would be an important thing for you to know. <laughs> But anyway, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Crypto Critics Corner. This was, of course, sponsored by Do Kwan and Luna 2. If you guys are interested, please go out there. No, 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 no. Do not. Do not. This is not financial advice. Never, ever buy anything that Do Kwan touches or Luna 2. Take care, everybody.